You are now listening to the Drunken Monks Podcast. Good evening. Once again, people, this is the Drunken Monks Podcast. My name is Marla Brown, Fast Denise Fiber. And believe you me, I am excited for tonight because we got a special guest in the building, the Honorable MP, Member of Parliament of St. Martin, Miss Melissa, ain't there for no shorts, gums. Good night, sweetheart. How are you doing this evening? I'm good, I'm good. (laughs) Yo, what's good, sweetheart? I'm good. Yo. Happy to be on the Drunken Monk. Yo, we, we've been trying to get you for, for like a couple of weeks. Nah, nah, man. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. your schedule is always tight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like it's almost as if they have a job, you know? Like it's almost- President Gomez <laughs> Secret. That's where we're at. <laughs> Yo, man. Denise, good Yo. evening, sweetheart. How are you? I good, I good, I good. Yeah? Yeah, How man. Good? Lockdown, Can't is, lockdown treating you like a little good things things like are you able to uh, lockdown got me running up and down with work things so yeah what can What's we up? say you guys are on uh, another lockdown yeah yeah, man. Extended yeah lockdown. we started out as a semi lockdown but it it, it it turned into a proper one now because again like last week we had um easily about 1200 cases new in a whole week like one day yeah. was 500 plus easy so, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're pretty worried. You know, I have I have relatives on um on Curacao, and it's pretty pretty concerning for me as well. Yeah, to mm. see it just kind of skyrocket. Also, too that it's the the UK variant. I think you guys have yep. down mm-hmm. here, so also a concern. But staying positive and hoping um hoping for the best. Nah, man, look at this what it is. So before we get into it, people, uh, what are y'all drinking? I've gone with Old Faithful. <laughs> you see, now, 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 that's a message that you're trying to send to Rutte and his government that you're with them, you see? Like, that's... <laughs> oh, not even, not even. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to talk some conspiracy theories here this afternoon, too, no, girl, believe that. <laughs> yeah, 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 I can't wait for the comments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I be a fancy with my bubbles. Oh, like, like, Lovely. like. I am feeling good. And by the way, folks, uh, for those that don't know, um, this is the season finale. This is why, too, I'm feeling kind of good about it, because we got through the whole season. Ten episodes, back to back, without fail, consistent as all hell and everything went the way that it was supposed to. Um, yeah, uh, Mel is here. I want him so. But I'm lucky enough. I got myself a little bit of Jameson today, oh, despite the lockdown. And that one is also quite... Uh, kind of a, like a things coming around because Jameson was what inspired the show in the first place. Nice. So Full circle. Salute to my to my co-host and to our honorable guests. Cheers guys. Salut. Mm-hmm. All right, let me get into it. Mel. Yeah. Who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, um Tell yourself. Melissa Gums, born and raised on St. Martin, uh, went to the illustrious Jolly Dwarf Kindergarten at the time and uh, St. Dominic Primary and High Schools, did my uh, tertiary studies at St. Thomas University in Miami, Florida. I got my bachelor's in business and my master's in international business. Came back home 2006, worked for Sonessa Maho. Learned a lot about hospitality. Learned that it's an industry that we severely underappreciate. Um, then after three years, uh, relocated to the Netherlands for a change. Uh, worked for TMF Group, which is a uh, trust company. Uh, saw and learned many things about the international financing industry. Um, trust in general, <laughs> which my favorite motto was, um, there's not a lot of trust in trust. <laughs> and, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then uh, also co-founded Unified St. Martin Connection while I was in the Netherlands with Cyril Fennings, um, you know, trying to help St. Martin students, yeah, become more accustomed or trans- have an easier transition uh, for when they left high school and came up to Holland. Uh, did, I think, in my opinion, great things while we were there, um, you know, started some key events that are, you know, mostly continuing today. Well, obviously not with COVID, but um, you know, our Christmas gala, sports day, just in general, trying to build some kind of unity amongst the Martiners in Holland and also 
um, introduce them to networking opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have, you know? Uh, we, I mean, we visited offices of Google, LinkedIn, um, you know, I personally, um, offices of Microsoft. So it's been, it's been fun times in Holland. And then I decided in 2012 with uh, Cyril and uh, Charlene Pompier that, you know, I think uh, we should start planning to move back home and make a change. Um, so we started laying the groundwork for what eventually became the Party for Progress. Uh, you know, working on what uh, would be our ideas, what would be our manifesto, what would we want to see changed, where do we see the key, you know, bottleneck issues happening on Samaritan, um, and how would we want to also improve our relationship with other countries in the kingdom and in the region, and then uh, thirdly, international. Um, so yeah, then in 2016, I moved back home, uh, started working for UTS, um, which was also interesting. So I've had, you know, experiences in three major industries, major global industries, hospitality, uh, finance, and um, telecoms. Saw how things work there on that end. Also, a lot of concerns from the government side, you know, not much of a vision for telecoms or ICT uh, coming from government here, as opposed to in Europe, you know, where they literally decided that the internet is a, is a basic right <laughs> to utility. Um, so it has to be, you know, fairly priced and freely available uh, to whoever may need it. And in 2019, we officially launched the Party for Progress um, in September of that year and found ourselves staring down the barrel of an election in January 2020. And after a blitz of a campaign, um, we came out with 1,407 votes, which was good enough for two seats. Uh, so myself and MP Rian Peterson now sit in Parliament um, as the PFP faction, doing our best to bring some balance, some facts and, you know, logical discourse to the floor of uh, the people's house. So yeah, that's, that's where we're at. <laughs> and you're talking to people melee. Every time I check in your Facebook, you're commenting on, uh, you know, you're busting the pot a little bit there. <laughs> I wouldn't say this, busting, more, more, I prefer lifting the veil. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. You no, know, we've we we have we have had and and still have um, a lot of misinformation and disinformation that that you know um, spreads rampantly on the island. You know, sometimes aided by you know media houses and um, sometimes not. And that's something that I I think we all have an example of how dangerous that can be in you know the uh, former president of the United States. Uh, we know what, you know, fake news and, and f alternative facts can actually, um, the damage that they can do to a society. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's one of the main things that um, Rihanna and I like to try to challenge, you know, and uh, it may not earn us the most favor with certain circles in the community, but we don't, we don't particularly care. Uh, we're, we're not here to represent a handful of people, you know, each MP represents 100% of the people. And that's uh, that's what we keep stressing on. Yeah. But but before we delve into your current work, you said that around 2012, you and two others uh, were planning to come back to St. Martin because you wanted to make a change and yeah. you started setting everything up and, 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 and uh, building the foundation. But why did you feel that politics was the way to change um, St. Martin uh, according to your vision? Well, we had done um, the work of USC was, like I said, dealing with students. And one thing that we quickly realized is that up until um, I moved to the Netherlands, most of the feedback that I would receive um, from parents or teachers or even government officials about St. Martin students in Holland is that they were lazy. Um, they changed their study too often. They don't know what they want. They're, they, you know, are entitled, etc. They're spoiled. And I said, but really, what is the problem, especially with the changing study, you know, because um, in the U.S., when you go on a student visa, you have a, a set amount of time to get your act together. Uh, you can't just decide one major this year, another major that year, because it doesn't extend with you, you know, unless you have to go through a process for that. Um, but in Holland, as Dutch citizens, you know, we have that freedom to explore what we want to do. Uh, but of course, that then could lead to, you know, a heavier student debt if you take longer to finish your, your, your bachelor's or so. And 
when we started that work with USC, we realized, oh, so the issue is not the students, actually. The, the issue is the foundation, which is in St. Martin, which is the education system. Um, you know, we I've said very often that you can't um, you can't build a nation on a, on a cracked foundation. And that I think for me, education is the, the point where we've consistently failed to innovate and, and evolve um, as a country. And that's where the workforce force issues, um, literacy issues, that's where everything kind of trickles down from. So with that, we said, well, you can't make changes to the actual system, the education system, um, without having that foot in the door, uh, which is the political system. Um, the Ministry of Education consistently receives the highest budget, but due to financial management issues, um, you know. Oh, that, that's what we're calling it this week. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> financial management issues. Financial that's management right. issues. All right, we're going to PC first. We're not too deep yet. Okay, good. No problem. That is the, that's the budget <laughs> that is rarely used. And if it is used, it's, it's in my opinion, and not applied properly. So, yeah, that's that's. That's why we decided, you know, um, while still continuing the community work route, because that's something that never stopped. It's something right. that I fell in love with while I was in the U.S. already, um, because they are big on volunteerism over there um, at my school and also in Holland, volunteering to help um, organize events for Amsterdam Pride or assisting um, Small Island Unity with Zoma Carnival, you know, just being able to reach out and help the community in whatever way continued when I came down here and it's now just translated into, you know, okay, I've helped in the community through these organizations and now I want to help directly at the, at the source. And right. here we are. Yeah. I have to admit because that's how, that's how you and I started to break bread. I mean, we are not a mutual acquaintance because it's your sister, <laughs> but I knew your sister before that I knew you and yeah. I got to know her quite, quite well. And to be honest, because you was always, um, and we'll get to that too, by, by the way, but you were destined to be politically astute. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to, to fall in that line as well. And so in, in getting to know your sister first, and by the way, shout out to Mika. How are you doing, sweetheart? Look at the show so you can get the shout out, God damn it. <laughs> right? Um, she, she used to speak very highly like, of you and, and finding out who like your pops was and one other. So when we when we did meet, it was a beautiful thing. And yeah. I have I have to admit, I was very impressed that the legend, like the person lived up to the actual <laughs> legend of the thing. Because That's no, but no, but listen, but no, not in a, like like not in a dick writing type of way, but it's just the fact that just competence and integrity, those those are your two standpoints. Like you gotta be competent and you gotta have a little bit of like a character. You know what I mean? When we got together for um, some like gaming back in the day, a gaming event, we yeah, were gonna yeah. check, see if we're going to name that just now. <laughs> but, but, but when we got together, it was your like organizational skills is what had impressed me. And the fact that, again, even though it's St. Martin and things are loose and whenever people come and whatnot, so hey, yo, time is time when it came to you and how did you like approach yeah. this? And I always thought that if you would have used that in a particular light, it'd be gangbusters. And we're now seeing the results of that. So I am quite happy with what you're doing these days as well. Thank you. Thank you. I ask you though, because all this led, leads to this question. Um, when you're planning on turning corrupt or when you're planning on trying to kill yourself? <laughs> one out of them two <laughs> got to happen if you keep down this line. <laughs> no, no, I don't, think, I don't think either of those two have to happen. <laughs> one, thing I, one thing I'm happy to see is that you have some people within the community, you know, as more people start to come home mm -hmm. and bring home new ideas, less you see it more and more that they're beginning to question, but why, you know, and, um, and ask themselves, is this really the, the only way that we can do this or can it be, do better? You know, you have people doing amazing things and they've had to kick down doors to do it. Like the, the battle joes of this world, you know, pushing for entrepreneurial um, um, success and, and attention um, at the Chamber of Commerce, Jen Fakati, other young civil servants in government. Um, I got to big up my girl, Mackie Brooks, in that. Yeah, Mackie, yo. Mackie is doing amazing. Mackie Brooks, SMDF, yo. You know, cultivating other young professionals, also at SMDF, you know, Janai, Melanie, et cetera. So it's it's basically us. I, I How I view it uh, is that 
the more of us start to climb to that and pull up others with us, because that's something that you see particularly well at SMDF, for example, and other um, organizations, is the better it's going to be for us. Because then you have more people that are trying to share their critical thinking skills and analyses with other people who may not have the time or the patience to pay attention, um, you know, 100%. Even we started a, a, a live stream because for me, when I look at the Caribbean and I look at St. Martin, I think this. And it, it was actually said to me, to my face, um, by a gentleman originally from St. Kitts on the side of the road outside Parliament. And he said, you know what's always surprising to me? He said, the average Kittitian knows more about politics than the average St. Martin knows more True. about political systems, whether it's in, in the world, than the average in Madden. And that's very true. You have people who we are 10 years a country and they still think that I'm a minister, that they voted for me to be a minister. And that's, you know, I have to correct them each time. And we did our best during campaign to explain to people, look, we are running for parliament. And that is why in our manifesto, we had a section on parliament and what kind of legislative action we want to take. Because it can't all be big projects, you know, that we don't have the power to do those things um, as mm -hmm. parliament. So, so that's, it's, it's redirecting people's focus from the old school. You know, you're going to build this, build that roundabout bridge, whatever, whatever, um, fireworks. And you're actually in parliament. It's first of all, you know, a violation of Trias Politica to try to govern from the seat of parliament. And and it's it's something you hear Rayon very passionate about. Um whenever we're sitting and, and he's hearing something that's like, hey, that's not how it's supposed to go. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think, um, I think, yeah, it's the more people get into it, the less I feel like there's, there's pressure on me to change. And also, I just want to state, you know, I said it a lot during campaign. I'm going to tell you a story to tell you the type of person that I am. <clears throat> when I worked <clears throat> in Utah, I was customer service manager. Yes. Uh, every week, every Tuesday and Thursday, every Tuesday and Thursday, UTS, I don't know how it is in Carousel, but they run disconnections. So choose for whoever they pay the internet bill. Right. Tuesday and Thursday. So there was a day um, I got the list at, I think, 10 o'clock in the morning. And I, you know, you go down to see if there's anyone that you need to take off. Now, normally you try not to disconnect um, critical um, systems, you know, banks, for example, insurance companies, the hospital, police station. You leave them right. on and then, you know, they get cursed walked and all those people. Right, uh, right, they right. a couple extra days to pay and going down the name the names i saw my dad's and i looked at it and i said oh well he's in for a surprise and i sent back the list and i said no no one to take off today and the billing and collections contact they called me and they were like are you sure there's no one you want to take off the list i said no i'm sure and but he's got two hours later, up. <laughs> And my dad called me 15 minutes after this connection ran. I said, hey, I'm here at my office and my internet's off. I said, mm hmm you owe $60. <laughs> he was like, you let them disconnect me? <laughs> yeah. This was the time Mr. Glencarty came up to me and said, you leave your father get disconnected? And I said, mm, yeah. yeah. He was like, why? I said, because all oh, you need to know the type of person that I am. I don't care who you are. Rules are rules. Regulations are regulations. This is this what it is. You could be my father. You could be my sister. I, is it life or death? You don't need it. And by the way, again, to, to come back, your pop saying just any and any man, no dread. So, yeah, but I'll cut off Denise because she was ready to jump into what going on with well, you. So, I, uh, Melissa said like 500 things that I want to jump in to. But <laughs> the last thing you said, rules are rules. I think that is a very interesting um, statement. Um, rules are rules. Um, how do you feel about uh, the prime minister, the Martin prime minister, not wanting to sign the outfootings agenda? I'm not sure if it by now happened, but she had to sign it. Yeah. Um, um, Council of Ministers signed off on it. And then um, the um, prime minister left for, well, for family yeah. matters. She left off island and then... So the last oh, thing we heard was that it, and it was in the middle, but um, rules are rules. What, yeah, what do we feel still, about this? She's still off island and um, for family <laughs> issues, which, you know, I, I understand. Um, I also understand that it could have been signed off before she departed. And I think that she should have. And I think this is, and I've, I've said it publicly, so I don't mind saying it here, that 
we've come to a point now within between St. Martin and the Netherlands anyway, and I guess within the kingdom as a whole, that it seems to be a tit for tat. Um, you do this thing I don't like, so I'll do this thing I don't like. But if there's one thing I've been trying to explain to people and, you know, whether you want to look at it from, um, you know, co uh, colonial structures or whatever, we live in a global village and there is an order to things. Um, smaller islands in this region have realized that they have to have some kind of negotiating capacity with bigger countries and international agencies. But we don't seem to understand that we also still have to have these negotiating capabilities, even within our own kingdom. Um, it's not that, you know, we, the, 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 there's a democratic deficit that everyone has acknowledged. No one has really taken any steps to deal with it, um, you know, which is unfortunate. But this tit for tat, it can't continue because, you know, at the end of the day, who is suffering is the very people that we are claiming to be trying to protect. And that is what baffles me the most about the decision not to sign the, the implementation agenda, because it's just a signature. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's easy to say I can leave it for my deputy. I don't know if that's what the, the conversation was, but why? If you are assuming a position that is a leadership role, then you have to be willing to willing and able, sorry, to take everything that comes with it from the glory to the grit. Right criticism you know the memes the whatever that, that 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 comes with it um and i think that you know it's 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 definitely unfortunate but it's a yeah it just continues the kind of um belief this government has that they don't have to apply diplomacy when you know dealing with even if, if you can't apply diplomacy when dealing with the netherlands in whose kingdom you sit then i don't know if you think about 30, 40 years down the road, if we continue this train of thinking, um, how are you going to deal with a China, a United Nations proper, a IMF, you know, um, a Barbados, a Caracom, you know, how do you, how do you deal and negotiate and, and not have emotional tantrums every time something goes wrong? Because I look at it as, um, it cannot be that everything that is wrong here can be blamed on the Netherlands because before we became a country, everything that was wrong here was blamed on Caruso. Yeah. Well, yeah. So it's kind of, it's weird Yo. for me. We run it Yo. from one month to the next, basically. Yo, we got, um, I think this is a hell of a stopping point because the next segment, we're going to get into it. And uh, we already touched a little light onto what it was and what I'm so, but um he is ready for it. I'm ready for it. And for sure, Melissa is ready for all the smoke. So, um, <laughs> guys, um, go to the bathroom. Do whatever that you got to do. We will be right back. All right. We're back. Um, and let's get right into it. Um, before the break, Melissa, you were talking about the kingdom. Well, actually, the relationship between Saint Martin and and, and the Netherlands, but also uh, the kingdom um, going forward. How do you see uh, kingdom relations, and and what would you want in the future, uh, constitutionally speaking, for um, in any case, Saint Martin? Yeah. Um, right now, it's very murky. Uh, it's it's very tough to say what the relationship is going to look like. I mean, I know what I would like it to look like. I would like there to be more diplomacy and tact applied on both sides um, here and across the Atlantic. Uh, so you want like, the, the structure of the kingdom to remain like in a kingdom form? Yeah, I don't have any issue with the the constitutional state that we're in right now because we've only been in it for 10 years and I don't believe we've made the best of it. Um, I, I don't believe that I think the only island that is thriving, I guess, in their constitutional structure within the kingdom is Sabo. Um, and I know that has a lot to do with the, the people that they have um, working in their local administration that are pushing for projects, executing projects, carrying them, etc. Yes, there are there are issues. Um, I, I would never deny uh, that there are issues for all of us to have to deal with. But I think that they found a little niche of 
utilizing what is available and negotiating to the point where they get what they want done done but i don't think the the, the comparison in skill is fair but i see no, no. i see what you're doing i'm talking going. strictly from a, from a relationship perspective i think that they've done a better job at it um you know and i think a lot of people also get confused when i when i talk about relationship perspective because they think that i mean we just have to uh you know take whatever blows we soak and call it done But that's not what we've been saying at all. What we've been actually advocating for is uh, some assessment and some accountability and some acknowledgement of the fact that a lot of the issues that exist with especially our financial state um, is largely due in part to our inability to manage our finances. You cannot tell me that we were booming and on our way to three balance budgets because I know it's not true um, when we do not have the type of reserves that we would need to carry ourselves through a pandemic. And I'm not saying that we would ever have 100% of it because, again, we are a small island, but at least that we have the ability to, you know, hold on and just maybe not take a, a full handout, but ask for some assistance and not actually rely. It's very tough to play bad and big when you're actually relying on someone else to cover your bills. If I'm paying Marlo's rent, and his insurance and his car loan, et cetera, Marlo can't actually complain to me about anything. Well, um, I mean, if I don't like the color of the car, what went on with you? <laughs> I wanted to say Curacao politicians, Aruba politician, please take note, just watch this, rewatch it, rewatch it and rewatch it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's in English, so they wouldn't understand. So. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Because again, it goes back to it goes back to the question of, um, for example, here you know you have um, much to do about this decolonization movement, and the new committee in parliament, etc. Okay, I have never said that I do not see an independence in Martin moving forward. Do I think it will be difficult? Most definitely, and not just about us separating from the Netherlands, but also the consideration of the French side. Um, has anyone asked the collectivity if they plan to go independent with us? Because if not, then we need to prepare that if we just go and say that we want to be independent, whenever that deadline comes, like 10, 10, 10, if it's, if it's you know, um, 10, 10, 20, 20, you know, 50, 40 or whatever, um, if the collectivity isn't right there with us, then welcome border control. Mm hmm You know, these are the little pieces of nitty gritty that I don't think anyone really thinks about. And what we've, what I've been saying a lot is um, we, can, we have to get to a point where we understand that it, is, it ain't just about us. Um, we are, in essence, 16 square miles in the Caribbean Sea. We're no longer the, number, the only game in town, which we were, especially in the 90s. Um, you know, other islands have surpassed us in many areas. And we seem just content to say, oh, but we have the prettiest beaches, the best carnival. Okay. That, no, no. that, may, that may put food in mouths for a couple months, but what are we doing to make sure that we can put foods in mouths thereafter? And right. that is, is, is one of the things that we saw, especially happen with COVID, you know, that, Um, if you're booming, then that means you have an active middle class. But COVID showed us that actually we don't have a middle class. We have people that are hanging on and that are one or two missed paychecks away from poverty. Right. Um, no, but yeah. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That that one that one even leads to another conversation as well because I want to have it with you because we talk in politics this fucking round and again all the smoke. So I'm gonna make a statement that did not discuss with you and probably you and I might disagree with, but I just let you see from another perspective and to spark a conversation as well, right? The decolonization movement, believe it or not, I halfway agree with them, at least in the essence of things, right? When it comes to, I, I genuinely feel that the clusterfuck that is the, the islands as a whole and the Dutch islands in particular, It has to do with not just the 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 the, the like the nuts and bolts, but it has to do with the story. And I think that that part, like me and D, tend to talk a lot about like narrative and and symbolism and all that type of shit. 
And that decolonization thing is a big one because it's easy to go back to certain symbols and rely on certain symbols to show these things. Holland telling me what to do yet again. You know what I mean? That is the main cry. Whether it's right or wrong, that is the debate. But here's okay. what I would put in front of you. As a technocrat, as a person that deals in the meritocracy, by the way, what would you, and as an extension, what would your party do to help that narrative? Because it's easy to say, let me have more tact and let me have more diplomacy, like or whatever. But it's a lot harder in practice because people's feelings are caught up in a lot of this shit. And, and you yeah. really tangle that first. So how would you do that? Untangle it? Yeah. I That's really, a good start. I don't carry I don't carry the the emotions of it. And I think that we tend to react more than we act. Um right. yes, I agree with you. Once again, the Netherlands is telling us what we have to do. But if you think about, for example, just to go back to last year, actually 2017. Um, God, we got 2010. That's just 2010. Fuck it. So back in the one of the thing, one of the top decisions, one of the top complaints that Holland has had about, um, especially Saint Martin, is that our members of parliament and ministers are paid very high salaries. Um, I've spoken publicly about it. Gross. Uh, about 19 grand and change. Dollars or gillers? Gillers. Before okay, right. the before the cuts made for COVID, so the first the 10% um, from 2019 and then an additional 15% once the Dutch told us, no, oh, you got to cut 25%. Um, that brings us to a netto of about 10,300 gillers, somewhere there, right? right? That is much more than anybody on this island makes. Right. Um, and sometimes I wonder if it's justified. You see, I, like you said, who my father was, I know exactly what members of parliament were making pre-10-10-10. I also know what ministers were making pre-10-10-10. The ministers, I think now their gross salary is about 21,000, somewhere there, Gillers. What's your own? But their minister um, for one island, and in 2009, a, a minister was taken home before taxes, about 9,700 gillers, somewhere there, 10,000, mm. give or take. And they were minister for five islands. There you go. So the, the excuse, the, the, the reason it has been given for the salaries is, you know, um, yes, we took the civil servant scale and, and, and put MPs and ministers attack above, et cetera. But you see, that only works if the civil servants are also moving up with you. Rising tide lifts all boats. There was no money to do that. Right. <laughs> so the civil servants have not moved up with us, and they're supposed to be our middle class, as the Minister of Finance said. You know, they are the middle class, but they are struggling. Even but but then, struggling. Some, but then, but then, but then, but okay, but then you, you getting a part of that pie right now, too. Yeah. So, and I tried to cut that pie first. Really? One of our first, first motions ever brought in Parliament was to cut our salaries by 15% before the Dutch conditions came down. Because diplomacy, we are in a crisis. Initiative goes a long way to negotiation. And if okay. we had taken that initiative, who knows how it would have gone thereafter. But everybody voted it down. In fact, they lambasted us in Parliament and said, yeah. Um, we just use our salaries to help people. Blah, blah, blah. It got to the point where to that statement, I had to say that if we had cut our salaries, you know, post- It would help month, a lot more, a lot faster. It would help a lot more than you just helping a handful of people with your individual salary. So we'll and come again with that. Seems. I had to get on crazy, but but that's, that's, that's how it makes me feel because it's, you have to take initiative. You can't negotiate and you haven't taken initiative. We negotiating and they tell you, no, I don't want to do this. You don't get nothing, but I got to get everything. Come on. And yeah, so what yeah, happened yeah. is um, after that, Aruba ended up setting the tone for all of us by taking a 25% cut. There you go. D. And Holland said, that looks good. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> D, feel free. Feel free. Feel free. Yeah, well, I wanted to ask how was the motion received, but of course it was voted down is what you explained. But can you tell us a little bit about um, how it was coming into parliament, like a, 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 a new party, young people, 
um, in the eyes of the people, no political experience, even though um, some of you come from, let's say, political legacies. Mar yeah. Like how, and then, and not only that, then you're coming with these ridiculous motions of cutting the salaries, um, saying that, you know, independence right now is too fast. We just need to, you know, get ourselves in, in, in check and order the things and yeah. coming with all these non-traditional views, if I may, may call it that. So how, how has that been? It's been interesting. Um, You know, I think the benefit is that Rayon and I have a very close relationship and we we tend to hold one head in parliament. Um, of course, with our own individual opinions and such, but our opinions usually line up. So there's no, you know, there's no clash there. And just keeping it together with each other, um, you know, they make um, their remarks in the media, in parliament itself, a lot of cracks, um, et cetera. But I don't take those things seriously because I grew up in that. Um, and if I was taking it seriously, I'd, I'd have gone crazy a long time. So it's been interesting. Um, not, I've not encountered some, anything that I didn't expect with, you know, knowing what my, my, my father himself experienced in the Netherlands Antilles, although he would be the first to say that the level was a bit higher back then um, when he had to be traveling to Curacao every minute uh, for meetings. And I think for me, I just want to see the level here go up and I want to see more critical discussions happening uh, that are fact-based and not emotion-based. And not to say that emotion should be completely missing from any discussion that, re that relates to the people's business, but you shouldn't be ruled by it. And it shouldn't just be about the emotion. I can feel, you know, terrible about this thing and angry about this thing, but at the end of the day, is it the best thing for the country? And then my anger has to take a backseat. But how do you get us how good how do you get the populace um and your your colleagues fellow politicians uh to that critical level of thinking yeah um for me we um try to keep it as fact-based as possible um if people stop me and they ask me a question i give them the exact same answer that i that they get in parliament and i think that's something that people have told me they appreciate that it doesn't change when i'm sitting in in the building or when i'm outside of the building Um, you know, <laughs> who I am here is who I am in there. And I think that's important because right now, a lot, a lot of times it's, eh, you know, screaming and then it's just a show, but I, we're not there for the show. And Ray, as a, as a, someone who studied kingdom law, um, you know, and, and knows it is pure facts. You know, um, we try to, to, um, talk to people as much as we can. We were intending to have like town hall meetings last year. But, you know, COVID and those are actually something that we're looking into restarting this year. Not that we can have small gatherings. We don't want to make it too big because we still want to maintain protocols, etc. But just to go back, because that was what really helped us, um, you know, prepare our, ourselves. And also on the campaign trail is just talking to people and just asking them, you know, what do you want? And if you look at the the, the trajectory that some are taking, it's it's. It's clear that they never asked that question. Yeah, Mar Marla? I got, I, I got a question for you, and I'm hoping that you'll be extremely candid and extremely open about this. Um, long and short, because you and I, outside of uh, this show and everything, we have a lot of discussions about how to reach people and how to do this and how to do that. But I got a question, though, or several, if you answer the first one. You want the party to grow, I assume. Yes. Right. right. How do you grow the party? How do you get from a thousand something odd votes to a majority place? Were you looking at five seats, six seats, yeah. seven seats, right? How do you get that and fight against the corruption that is so rampant on the island when it comes to elections and whatnot and so? How do you promise people the right way, the good way when somebody giving them money in the hand? Yeah. Um, that is that will always remain the difficult thing to do here. Right. Uh, you know, I can tell you honestly, during campaign, people, somebody literally walked in front of my Jeep and said, um, if you give me a car to drive around for the campaign season, I'll get votes for you. Or, um, you know, we need to pay our rent this, this month, you know, I'll get votes for you. And it's, it's, it's sad because this is the point that we've been brought to the culture that has been practiced, but there are ways to kind of stop that. I think that 
taking a, a solid look at actual electoral reform that doesn't have to be anything big. Um, a lot of a lot of people feel like Article 59 should be taken out of the Constitution and blah blah blah. Uh, I don't believe in that. I don't believe it should be. I think it's a it's a tool that maybe has been misused, but could is is important still. But there are little things that you can do, um, barcoded ballots, et cetera, um, for example, uh, other things around the election process itself to make it more secure, to discourage um, the type of vote buying that happens, particularly on election day. Uh, it's like a public secret at this point in time. Um, and I think that that's one part of it. The second part is honestly talking. It's, it's actually speaking to people. I, I can say that I felt at least that I changed quite a few minds during campaign and even on election day with, as I said, just being honest with people. And you can tell, I think, by what happened last election, people are tired of the usual. Um, I know that there were some very creatively shot videos of rallies and stuff like that. that makes it look like there was a lot of people, but I made it a point to drive by as many of them as I could once they didn't fall on a night, we had something. And it's not what was purported on, on, on Facebook, you know? Right, um, right, right. The fact that people have even become exhausted with that, and that was pre-COVID, you know? <laughs> you could tell that people were just tired and they actually have um, election fatigue. Uh, what I also take heart in is the fact that um, an important day for us was nomination day. So you have postulation day, which was the 21st of November, I believe. 21st. Right. Yeah. And then nomination day is the next day. And that's when you have to collect signatures um, to be able to contest the election. If you don't, if your party is not sitting in parliament, you have to collect these signatures. So it was us, um, the UP party, uh, SMCP um, and PPA that were basically the government building um, trying, you know, to get convince people to give us these signatures, you know, between us, our parents, we maybe had like 20, 30 um, signatures, but we didn't know where we were going to get the rest. And I think it was 130 something that you needed to be able to contest. And we started at nine in the morning, eight in the morning, somewhere there. Uh, and by 11 a.m. we had, um, we had already cleared our, our quota, what we needed, and then some. And by the end of the day, 311 people had signed to give us the right to contest the election. Um, that alone was, you, if, you t if you put it in perspective, um, Rayon uh, received 219 votes on his own, and it would still take him and, um, let's see, our number eight candidate, Lucho, 100 and something votes, yeah, to make it to what we got on signature day. So that's already, like, you know, a sign that, hey, People wanted to see us run. I was taken aback. By 11 a.m., we were the only party that had cleared our votes, that, that had cleared our signatures. Even, like, even with the up party? Even with the up party there. They, party at T.O. Heiliger, if people don't know. Yeah. T.O. Heiliger, if you don't know about Samantha. Just, yeah. So, yeah. So, I think, I think that those little signs, because that was even discussed by the, the, you know, the skeptics on the French side radio station um, as something remarkable. So, those little signs, I think, are showing that there's a shift. And I believe we just have to stay the course of what we're doing right now. I don't think mm. that things have to have to become drastically different. Um, you know, we we campaign on just being frank and honest with people. I we made no promises. The word promise never left our mouth. We just said we will do our best to accomplish this if we're given the opportunity to govern. And if we're in parliament, this is what we're going to do our best to accomplish. Because there's also um, I have a lot of patience because people generally do not understand. The legislative process, the time yeah. it takes, the fact that we have a lack of legislative lawyers on this island. Uh, yeah. So we don't have it like in Curacao or Aruba, um, you know, or the Netherlands. So, you know, as a, as, a, as a hard truth for you, I think our legal affairs department here in government has three people. If that. What's your love? So, yeah, it's those little things, I think, if we keep stay the course and continue just communicating from a point of honesty and facts and not, hey, I promise I'm gonna do this for you. Um, I think that gen it generally it will result in growth of the party. Um, COVID really put a dent in what we wanted to do growth wise, but hopefully we can get it going for 2021 and then again into 2022 as okay. uh, the vaccine deployment you know, continues and more people can gather and stuff like that. 
I would give D one more question, and then after that, I think that we could take a break. Just one question. Okay, take four. Shit me up, man, woman. Ah. Um. Well, what I'm interested to know is, um, you started, uh, or the party started by a group of young people wanting to change. You all planned this out. Uh, did the community work, talked a lot, um, explained a lot of stuff to people. Um, but how can you, um, as a young person who doesn't have a lot, like start a party? Because I'm thinking this is, is really interesting. You're right. Uh, people want to change. I think it's 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 way past time that the, that the political, the way we, we do politics, I guess, changes. But it's very hard as somebody young um you don't have a lot of money how can you do this how like campaigning yeah. you explain it sounds like it's a very long process and it's yeah. and it's very um <clears throat> consuming time consuming um yeah so how how can you for example start a party yeah so one of the things that i would advise is find people that you know from the start think like you Um, and that share at least your values and your ideals. I'm not saying you all have to have the same thoughts all the time, but if you can come to an agreement that, you know, this thing is bad and should not happen, that's already a great start. Because in, in you see it sometimes here too, inside factions, there's one guy that thinks, oh, well, it's not that bad. And another guy that thinks it's terrible and it's a clash. Um, so that's the first thing. And then second to that, uh, yeah, it is expensive. The notary costs, you know, alone, we were very lucky to, um, I approached a, a, a family friend and I said, look, this is what I want to do. I need help with the in incorporation costs. And we received help for that. Um, a lot of parties do receive help for that, whether from family members or themselves putting it up, et cetera. That's also fine. But a lot of the um, smaller costs, you know, flyers, stuff like that, I paid for with my own money, um, the launch event you know, paid for with our own money, et cetera, everybody chipping in. And it's, it's, it's also to explain to people that that is expected, you know? And one thing that I think we did um, that uh, I had, I was very adamant about um, in terms of materials, you know, posters, I didn't want to overdo it. I feel that um, it, if I see the same face six times in a row, I start to question the, the logic of it, you know? So we came to a decision that um, we would camp, we would put up posters, but, Um, the party would pay for up to five or six, for example, for each candidate. And then thereafter, you would on your own if you wanted to put up more, um, which not many people. And I even tried to cap that because I also didn't want it to look like how it has looked in the past, where you have the number five candidate with, you know, 100 posters around the island and the number 20 candidate has four. You know, because they're yeah, kind of yeah, left, yeah. left in the cold. So we try to to um, also control that for our candidates, which I think worked out well. And T-shirts as well, try to limit because nobody, just because people wear your T-shirt doesn't mean that they're going to vote for you. It's nice to have. And I think we had some snazzy shirts. So you didn't see our shirts? Dude, yeah, I saw it. Dude, what the fuck? But I'm just doing the thing, you know? You know? <laughs> yeah, pretty snazzy, pretty snazzy. <laughs> um, so that was good, and and that was that was um, good as well. But because I we also positioned ourselves as an environmentally conscious party, um, you and you know, t-shirts at the end of the day are waste. Mm -hmm. um, I, I myself have gone to the beach. You see an old political t-shirt under the sand somewhere. Somebody used it to dry off the dog or whatever. You know, people wash their cars with it, discard the rags, and that, that's that's what happens. You know, come on, Tio, come on, let me go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's what happens. So if, if if why would I flood the island with you know five thousand shirts This of just well. myself? You know, so those kind of things. Um, approaching sponsors that you um, are proud to say were your sponsor. You know, um, because all of this information is 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 going to be filed at electoral council anyway. Uh, our parents also really supported our vision. That's important. If there's one one piece of advice my father gave me, um, and I kind of looked at him like. When I was, when I told him that I was starting a party, he said, um, have you talked to your family about it? <laughs> <laughs> Because his favorite thing to say was um, this joke. I think this guy was from Bonero Curacao. And, you know, he told his wife, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going on a list. He didn't discuss it with her. He just said, I'm going on a list. And his wife said, I don't want you to run. And he was like, well, I'm running. And he went, he ran. 
election day come and in his district is only one is only one vote his vote <laughs> going to vote for him <laughs> that get cut one time this is what you it know, is you know my father was like you don't want to take that risk so try to you know talk to your family mm-hmm. make sure that they're on board because that's it that's your support system listen when i that's i just- they had yeah they had this during the campaign i didn't eat you know whole day that my sisters like did you eat i'm like no and she brings food and you need that kind of support for you because it's is grueling it's grueling sure. just just for context um for those of you who are not on St. Martin or probably uh, uh the SS Islands um Melissa's father is Marcel Gums <gasps> Google him. He's um, he was the second uh, prime minister of Saint, of country Saint Martin, and before that he had a long career in the uh, Netherlands and Antil- Antillian politics. Yeah. He was also one of the first uh, senators in the Netherlands and Antilles, if I'm not mistaken, right? He was a, he was a senator, yes. Um, yeah. Also state secretary of justice yep. in general. Yeah. Knighted, the whole fucking nine. He's he's fucking royalty at this point. So yeah. So that's that's who I'm friends with apparently. What the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Now guys, ah uh, good 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 stopping point for that. Um folks, I got to refresh my drink cuz I'm empty. I I am an alcoholic after all, so I got to maintain. Mental alcoholic. I'm a high functioning alcoholic. I'm a high, high functioning. Alcoholic. High functioning. This is what People it is. People drink responsibly and don't always be a high functioning alcoholic. Always jokes is jokes, but always people do not do something stupid. And um in covid times too, even that exacerbates that even more so um guys we'll be right back welcome back folks Woo! lord have mercy episode going good feeling good look at she even dance with it and all god damn it <laughs> marlo stop tooting your own horn man yo doing a bobby schmurda what the fuck you talking <laughs> <laughs> with it tonight boy yo mel <coughs> um actually glad that i got you actually glad glad that i got you because i'm a petty motherfucker and when it oh, comes no. to um you know certain things I, i like to stick it to people so you are a young professional very learned very go going forward all of these things you have never skipped a payment on nothing it seems right credit good Robert. right yeah. can you tell me the impact of being a gamer and being a nerd has had on your life take away some of that stigma from it sweetheart we going we going break down some fucking walls tonight well <laughs> along with improving my fine motor skills mm-hmm. uh being a gamer being a geek um you know has helps me in the sense that i tend to approach things from a logical perspective games are very often about puzzles um you know whether it's it's an actual puzzle game tetris tomb raider it doesn't matter there's always something to solve there's always right. some hieroglyph that needs uncovering or some <laughs> something that needs finding and scanning um right right, you know, right so i think i think that that does that does color a lot of how i look at things even if you you know what was very funny it's funny you mentioned that because i remember um last year february when after we swore into parliament before yeah after we swore in we had a week of orientation with right. dr nilda ardine lynch the former ombudsman right and right, right. while we were in breaks you know during that orientation i had you know my my handy dandy surface and i like to play plague ink now for mm. those who don't know plague ink oh, is a, It's exactly a um um you know a game where you create a virus and your goal is to infect the world's population infect and actually and kill. kill it off. Yeah, yeah, kill it off. That's how you win. And you know it it the game teaches you about um how important mutations are in a virus uh you know for for um longevity and for incubation period. Yep, incubation periods, how it's transmitted, is it does it do well in cold climates, does it do well in warm climates, all of that stuff. And I remember um I had it on the screen and and people on campus was like, "What's that?" So I explained to him what I was doing and um he was like, "Daddy, you in this 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 China virus thing too because back then, you know, we didn't have our first case yet." 
So it was like this mysterious thing. But I said, listen, if this game has taught me anything, is that that bad boy is coming to St. Martin. <laughs> you bet your bottom dollars. <laughs> you best believe. Nah, so yeah, so I think that games give you a different perspective of the world. And even in, 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 in politics, if you think about, you know, most of geek culture is um, it's a lot of political intrigue. Um, you know, Game of Thrones is one of the best political, um, you know, up until a point. Up until best season five. Yeah. No, we're not going to have to season five. Right? Up until season five. Yo, we don't really have to after season five. Yeah, no, it's a testament to politics and who plays the political game the best. And one of the things, that, to be honest with you, my least favorite character for a very long time was Jon Snow. Because, um, you know, very self-righteous, um, very, very much reminds me of, I don't know if you watch The Expanse. I haven't yet. I'm about to. Like, love. When you watch The Expanse, you'll understand what I mean when I say that he's very much like Holden. Um, because they, they, they're two characters that don't realize that sometimes you have to play the game. You may not like it, but you have to at least get yourself to a point where you can play it without completely losing your marbles. Um, and, and losing you your character. Play. Yeah. Right. So I think, um, I think that, that, you know, in fiction, in, in, in science, in, in games and stuff, that kind of logical thinking really does power a lot of how I look at... Um, how I look at things, how I look at resource management, even from a, from a city building simulation um, standpoint, you know, um, right. you know, we, Marvia Cooks and I are number five candidate. We had a, we have a project going under um, 4C foundation called for the win gaming. And one of the presentations we made once to some teachers was a city skylines, which is a city building game, but with realistic, realistic, um, impact on your decisions made so you know you can actually we did it where we put the uh, we built our city and we put the dump in the middle of the city and you could see real time how that impacted property value how that impacted health how it impacted people's morale etc and right. you know we showed that to some teachers and that's that's St. Martin's life our right, dump right, right. in the middle of our capital you know so you know, how does that impact your city? That's how, that's how you have to look at, at, at small islands, I believe, like a city. Um, yeah. You know, so that's, I think, uh, um, how gaming has really shaped how I, um, how I approach life and, and just generally, also some of the best quotes, you know, come from games. So. <laughs> and by the way, by the way, being as big a nerd as you are, you still got some pussy. I told you we're getting into it tonight. Uh. <laughs> I told you we're getting into it tonight. Yo, loud and proud. Fuck it. You can't call Amsterdam Pride and not talk about this shit. Let me go. Let's go. All the smoke. <laughs> All the smoke. All the smoke. Jesus Christ. But no, no, no. Let me ask you that one because, uh, because I never really got a chance. Because because you and I, I mean, we are partners. We are, we are partners. And some yeah, guys yeah. partners do what partners do. And we've, you know, we've talked about women in some way, shape or form. But I, but I, but I never asked you when. When did you figure that out? Like when did you like understood that about yourself? And because you're one of the most out and proud that I know, and in this, yeah. like 2021 is still cool, but you had to come through 1998 to get to here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, like oh. for me, I I realized pretty early on. I would say as young as seven, eight. Um, Jesus. That you know the because you have to understand too. In the Caribbean, we are generally. Um, hypersexualized from a very young age. So, uh, you know, so it's it's you know already what boyfriend and girlfriend is and stuff like that. When you're like eight, people make jokes, you know, oh that's your little girlfriend or that's her little boyfriend. I don't do those. I don't make those kind of jokes because I just find it sets a bad precedent for kids. But whatever. Um, so for me, I already realized from like seven or eight. Mm, I don't really think I feel about boys the way that they say I'm gonna feel about boys, but we'll see. And um, as right. I got older, I think by the time I was like 12, 13, I was like, yeah, nah, this is, this is not a thing. <laughs> so, that's Pamela why Anderson, I, change your life. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> I knew pretty much who, um, you know, who I was and, and that, yeah, that's, this is, this is who I am. And um, didn't really, I didn't come out until I was 21-ish. 
Jesus. Um, yeah, I came out first to some close friends um, while I was in Miami. Uh, <clears throat> you know, um, but to my parents, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't for. It wasn't until I was about twenty-one. Um, my sister already knew. Um, you know, both both her and Justina um, knew, and. I was also surprised that most of my high school friends also knew. They were not. They were not shocked, which was good. I mean, um, no offense, but you're a little stip- stereotypical, my sweetheart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did my best. I wore. You're a not a lipstick prom. lesbian. Let's I call it like wore, that. <laughs> I wore a dress to prom, so. We had a partner, though. Fuck you. <laughs> but yeah, so that's that's um and and indeed, you know, going to school in Miami. Um, right. You know, seeing the struggle there, the very real struggle, and then living in the Netherlands, you know, for for six years, um, you kind of see what it could be like, and it's it's just it's normal. You know, I never felt any kind of fear, um, even here. I have to say, it, it was never really a fear of mine. But I also know that women tend to have it better, easier than men, um, you know. But then oh. men and trans women and and, and trans men. Um, so yeah, for me, I, it is who I am. It's part of me, but it's not all of who I am. And I've always approached it like that. Like, you know, I'll, Amsterdam, working in Amsterdam has basically got me to the point where I'm just talking and I'm just like, yeah, my girlfriend and I, you know, just throw it out there. And, um, people are like, oh, <laughs> if they don't, if they haven't already caught the hint. Um, yeah. And, and I think, that was a big concern of mine going into the election, actually, because, you know, we are pretty conservative. Are we? Yeah. In certain I, respects. Yeah. In certain respects. In certain respects. I said once on a panel that I participated in um, for SAFE that, you know, we are a hyper, we are a hypersexualized society that is also very sexually repressed. Yeah. Um, we don't talk about sex openly. Uh, we don't talk about, you know, um, sex between men and women, sex between women and women, sex between men and men. We don't talk about those things. A lot of innuendo. Whisper. Yeah, it's a lot of innuendo. It's a lot of innuendo, whisper. a lot of keeks. We don't call a thing a thing, um, yeah. you know, and, and that is part of the, the, the stigma, I think, that has to kind of go away. But going into the election, um, I had my concerns. To the point where I'll be honest, I even said, you know, if you guys are certain that you want me as party leader, this is the risk that we're going to all be taking, and um, it didn't, it didn't really impact, um, you know, for me then how how things went. I was very surprised by by the final vote count, um, even my own, even my personal vote count, you know, and the only backlash that I saw came from. Um, you know, a church in Colby that had a live stream service where they were talking about, um, I don't even know what they were talking about. I just know that it went from a picture of, was it old or so, with the first ladies or the first, the first mates or whatever of um, European leaders. And I believe is the prime minister of Luxembourg is married to a man. He's openly gay. Is it Luxembourg? I think it's Luxembourg. Yeah, it's Luxembourg, yeah. Yeah. And um, they had that magazine picture with all these first ladies and then the first husband, you know. And um, then it's the uh, pastor says, you know, put up that other picture and it's us on swearing in day. And Jesus they call Christ. out myself and the prime minister, not by name, but they say there's two of them in our government. I'm like, them. They're multiplying. But they can't have kids. What's going yeah, on? Yeah, so I was like, oh, that's interesting. But actually, <laughs> that video that? got so much backlash on social media that I didn't feel worried about it at all. I just was like, oh, no, okay. but you know why? No, but 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 there's a reason why. And and I won't I won't turn a lie. Outside of like you know the morning post and the morning devotional, auntie and uncle ain't on socials. Not yeah. like that. You understand what I mean? is a young man game and young people, whether or not, like, like even the most conservative ones have leaned a little left is what I'm feeling. They might have a problem with it, but they know they're going to get a lot of shit if they come out of the fucking window. And so yeah. I feel that that's, that, that is your moment. And I'm feeling glad for you with that one is concerned too as well. Um, at, at the very least, because I put it akin to, like when it comes to politics and character of will and all that type of shit, I place it in the same place that Chris Rock had placed, like Pork Chop. I refuse to believe that this is what's going to keep me out of fucking he- heaven. You understand what I mean? 
nowadays. Yeah. And like in that sense, uh, it don't matter if I like this on the third, am I doing the work properly? That is the question. And that was my biggest, you and I spoke, that was one of my biggest fears for you going out, you know, because I, me, me and you talk like basically like a little bit of strategy, yeah. but like, yo, Jay, they're going to come at you, Jay. like they really, and, and it didn't happen. I yeah. Like, it. no, but I was expecting, but it never happened. Right. But, but Melissa, why do you think it didn't happen or not at the scale that you expected it to happen? I think that over the years, um, it has been, you know, I wouldn't say fully normalized, but I also look, I lean on the fact, yes, that women usually have it easier than men when they are gay or bisexual, um, you know, but there's also the fact that I'm also a masculine presenting um, lesbian. I wear suits, I wear ties. So that for me was like the main thing, like is my clothing going to impact, you know, um, how people perceive me as a potential leader, et cetera. Um, and I think that there's been a lot of work done over the years uh, you know, from whether it's safe or it's it's um, AIDS foundation, et cetera, to kind of normalize and, and, and make this just a, yeah, okay, where people end. Um, and I think to younger people that have come back with their experiences, whether at um, Toronto Pride or New York Pride, Amsterdam Pride or whatever, um, you know, that they are also kind of like, well, it's not that big a deal. Um, and older people too, I think, have slowly come around, you know, to to... A lot of people know me, I think, and I think they view it as, you know, she's really just another person, I guess. <laughs> so it wasn't the, the what I expected or anticipated or prepared for. It, it wasn't that. And I was very happy about that. But how do you deal? Because there are memes. Um, there are memes and there are, there are like the crazy church, or I should not say crazy, but the church in Cool Bay, for example, yeah. there are these spats of of yeah of, oh, of crazy meanness or and homophobia how do you deal with that because now you're a public figure so yeah. now it's it's even worse and thus they say uh hoge bomen van a veel wind so if you're in a, in a in a high position in a public yeah. position you get a lot of shit and and you should and you're expected to deal with a lot of shit how is yeah. how, how do you deal with that to be honest i haven't really gotten any memes about me being um gay I've gotten a lot of other memes about me being, you know, the Dutch party <laughs> or whatever. Just the house That's nigga. Just as bad, yeah. even worse. I mean, the house the nigga. Country. Remember that. Don't ever yeah. forget the place. You're high red. You got good hair. Just the house, the house nigga. House slave. Yes, I know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I've not, I not gotten that since since that video last year, February. Nothing has ever come directly to me. If it's out there, I I don't get it. And I usually get a lot of stuff. You know, I get the Dutch party memes and all that stuff, but nothing that is, you know, blatantly homophobic or anything like that. And I'm, I'm happy for that. Um, in fact, I think it's unfortunate that, you know, the prime minister seems to get a bit more of it than I do. Um, and I, you know, I think it's reprehensible when it happens to anyone. It doesn't matter that she's from another party or, or so, but... You know, at the end of the day, um, she's a person with her personal life, and that's that's no, but 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 let's but let's be honest, no, Adrian. And again, <laughs> nothing against the prime minister, nothing let's against the prime honest. minister, right? <laughs> None against the prime fucking minister, but at least in a verbal exchange, she does not look like she's gonna give it to you. She might scold you. She might tell you, you know, like there's oats and there's peanut butter in the fucking cupboard. Crack and like, up, <laughs> If you do not have the type of bread you like in your house, eat crackers. Put in a bottle, crackers. <laughs> right? But you, listen, and I swear to God, I'm going to put them up and post, yo, all them fucking tweets, all them Facebook posts, and then ones that drive. Yo, you just, you just make my morning sweet and both sweet and fucking terrifying because, oh, shit, my friend done jump into it this week, boy. <laughs> Going on, no, but I think Myrtle has a point. <laughs> Don't you feel that that fellow um, MPs at least are afraid to be roasted? I don't know if it's roasted, but you just spill in the tea on Facebook. You you don't use names, but you call out yeah. the things like you you you, you kind of have you have a dirty, a dirty laundry, you know, a thin line of respect by not calling out the names. But anybody that know yeah. what's going on know exactly what the fuck going on. <laughs> <laughs> because because the people the people of this island are not stupid and you know they you keep know. being talked to as though they're stupid and i'm like no i take offense to that 
Um, you're not going to sit here and tell me that the reason our education system is where it's at is because of the Dutch. <laughs> they have no responsibility towards it. That has been our responsibility since even before 10-10-10. Right. I know it because my school made the decision to go from the American system to the British system. The Dutch didn't tell them to do that. They decided to do it, mm. <laughs> you know? So it's it's something that is, anything that has been in our hands um, I take offense to people, especially some of my, my colleagues past, you know, present, um, saying that, oh, it's this and it's not, you know, that. And I think, you know, I don't know if last year around June, you read a letter that I wrote, uh, Marlo, you know, that I, I mean, that alone should have said that I honestly not here for the nonsense. And yeah, you're not, you're not here for the bullshit. Yeah, no, I'm not, I... I'm going to call it out because nobody has ever called it out. And um, for me... Give a little think, bit of context, if you don't mind. Just give a little bit of context. So, that people... so last year, a former member of parliament was on a radio tour where um, he was basically stating that, um, you know, the Dutch are trying to um, take over and it's they're doing it this way. They want to make us like the European Dutch. And that is really what set me off because... Um, some of the things that he was saying, it didn't sound like it's so bad that we are like that. For example, he said, um, you know, we are not a people that saves our money. You know, we enjoy life. We spend our money, et cetera. And I'm like, it's easy to say that when you have enough to spend. But exactly. I think actually that we have to move from a culture of people that don't save. And whether we're being like the Dutch or we're being like the Finnish or the Swedish or the other frugal countries, that we actually teach financial responsibility to people. Dude, hurricanes alone got you thinking about that. Be yeah. it that you got to invest in a house to either protect against the house or when shit goes left and you need to hold on and exactly. you need to add a bill back or whatever so, the fuck. What, so for me, using that mm. as an example of why it's bad that the Netherlands wants to make us, like, I don't think that that's the case at all. Teaching right. people fiscal um, literacy is not making them into something else. You know, it's it's... You're teaching them how to prepare for their life. And that's the thing. We, I got a question on the campaign trail at the debate where they said, you know, um, yeah, what are we going to do about the pension, blah, blah, blah. And I said, indeed, the pension, um, you know, has not increased. But also, too, pension age has also not increased. And if you look at even regional trends, we are lagging far behind in our pension age. Um, people are living longer. So not expecting them to work longer is a little strange to me, mm -hmm. you know? And then also right. to the state, I, I made the statement that the, the, especially the Aove, that was never supposed to be the be all end all in most countries, especially in Holland, they teach you, you have your pension, but you also should take steps for yourself supplemental. to create your pension. supplemental exactly. pension, supplemental right. income. Nobody here does that. And why? Um, because we don't want to be like the European Dutch. That, that, that's basically what was being said. And but I wait. just couldn't, talk, couldn't let our pass, basically. Wait, 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 wait. But this, but this comes back all the way fuck around to the, to the beginning of the segment. Because I actually made a joke because I was trying to stick it to Denise a little bit or whatever. But fine. Right? But here's the thing. And it comes back to what I was asking too about too, when it comes to stereotypes and symbolism and narrative. That type of shit is what is like the easy shorthand for them to say, okay, that's the bad guy. We are the good guys. It's not wrong to take certain things off of Europeans. It's not, and trust me, hyper black fucking nationalists here. Understandable, like fucking colonialism and all these things. But if a fucking idea works, it works. So why can't we take it or even use it to build our own Wakanda? You check what I mean? What the fuck is wrong with you? At that point, there's a lot of times when identity gets lost in the mix when you try to argue nuance. You know what I mean? Like, like, like when you try to explain people about, hey, listen, look, they were assholes, but they have a good idea. You know what I mean? Or whatever yeah. the fuck. You have yeah. to separate certain things at certain times or at least compartmentalize. And what no, I love you for... Oh, sorry, D. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, but in your same train of thought and you say, yeah, you, you, you can pick stuff from Europeans that are good. But I think... We even have to even step back and, and uh, rethink that statement because you already um, go off of the point of view of, okay, that is a European thing and we take it over. But 
a lot of the times it's not a European thing. It's just a good idea. And oftentimes we already, we as Caribbean people already had those ideas. We already had those traditions, but through the years, it just, it just broke off, broke off and it, and then and it, it eroded and it faded away. But if you go look at our history and especially I think uh, St. Martin or Bonaire, um, the countries have always been countries um, with not a lot of financial resources to go around. So people were always like, if you look at your grandmother's generation, Even. they were always making do with what they had and then some. They were able to build houses. They were able to, to, to get, um, 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 you know, property and all these types of things. This, this is even just a four built fund fund saving and stuff. It's not European. It's it's we own, but we forgot and we we live in like it's yeah. one one big fat. But it it is just forgotten history, I guess. No, but, no, no, no. Sorry, Mel. Like I don't know if you want to take a jump in because because no, I'm, no, I'm I definitely, I'm definitely agree. <laughs> no, I definitely agree. Um, I think that you know the the we've fallen victim and it's been you know promoted. Um, by by former leaders and stuff like that to this idea of just consumerism, um, you know, where you have now it's easier for me to get a car than a than a mortgage. Yeah, that's sad. And, you know, Yo. you have car dealerships, you have casinos, which I I'm not I'm not a gambling person. Um, I don't enjoy them. I think that actually gambling is a terrible thing, and that the people who suffer from it and and who are most impacted by it are poorer communities and seniors. This, this cannot be in the middle of you know in the middle of a pandemic as soon as the the casinos reopen that I drive through Front Street and I see um, cars dropping off senior citizens to go inside to a casino and gamble. With no, but that's, listen, that's that's, that's, the, that's a question of increased. So it's like, what am I increasing it for? <laughs> you know? No, but listen, but no, all right, but I like how that you bring it back, right? Yeah. Let's 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 be honest and clear, man. Yo, all the islands got a boredom problem. All the islands got a fucking boredom problem. Be it senior citizens, be it young people, be it whatever, because a lot of the bullfuck that come from boredom. This is where gaming for us tended to be a good thing. Sports for certain people, theater for certain people. We have a boredom fucking problem. And boredom leads to some dumb shit. Boredom leads to haunting. Boredom, boredom leads to like, boy, let me try that. Let me do that. Let me whatever, whatever. You check one, man. No bullshit. You're the first person I ever hear publicly on my show, God, God bless, but publicly ever state that, yo, Jed, fuck the casinos for the same reason. Yeah. Yo, you do the math. I no. see fucking math. I got some math wait, 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 for you. I got some math for you. St. Martin has more casinos. I think we're up to 10, 11, 12, somewhere there. Mm-hmm. The state of Florida has seven casinos. Ah! The state the of state. Florida. The state, That's not a city, from one into the not other. Miami, oh. not Palm Beach, not Boca Raton, not Orlando. The state of Florida has seven we'll casinos. We'll see. We'll see. That don't tell you what's going on already. Yeah. Dee, you wanted to say something. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, you were saying that we have a problem of boredom. I'm not yeah. sure if I completely agree with that. But whose responsibility is it to, let's say, entertain? Is it tegenovergestelde van, van, van board? Being bored, I don't. Whose responsibility is it to be engaged and entertained? Because now like it's else? almost, huh? It's your own. Just listen. Just like anybody else, is everybody's responsibility. But there's leaders in every fucking thing. Yeah. Me and me and me and fucking Mel, like like she had a Facebook group. She talked about Game of Thrones, right? My girl put up a Game of Thrones fucking thing when it, when it was hot, season four, right? My girl put up a fucking Facebook group. All of we was in that group. Now, none of us would have had the sense to put up that group. She did. She is a leader. She put it forward. She's like, all right, we're going to talk about this fucking thing. And she even put the rules. Listen, first day after the show, second day after the show, third, we're not talking about it. Third day after the show, we could finally, you know, we could do something with it. That's the leader's partner. It's also that people have to start creating their own. Yeah, yeah. In 2019, I, I did, I organized, um, a viewing of the live action Lion King movie because I wanted to see it and I didn't want no brat spoiling it by crying or whatever. So I, I literally booked out the theater, created an event and sold tickets. This is what it is. I managed to sell 160 tickets, you know, that, and there were 160 people in there, people I didn't even know. 
um, came to that thing. And then, and then for Game of Thrones, for the season, for the series finale, the last season that we don't speak of, we don't um, speak of. watch parties, watch parties at, at Rusty Rockets. You help a, a small business and you get to watch Game of Thrones with your, with your friends who are fans and other people this that are fans. You know, those are the things that we I see hap- that I did in Miami that I'm like, mm, these things could work here. And it was something for people to do. People were happy about the Game of Thrones stuff because they're like, it's nice to go out and enjoy it with people. Mm-hmm. And if you would allow me the chance, D and Mel is not reinventing the fucking, like, like, it, like you don't got to reinvent the fucking wheel. These are things that have been done. These are things that to talk about outside and European or whatever the fuck, there are a lot of good ideas that have been done across the world for all kinds of shit. She started her like gaming group with uh, leaning on coding and fucking like education. I started mine on community and being able to bring people together. All it takes is people to, to actually, or persons yeah. to like say, you know what? I will stick my neck out just a little bit. Not even a lot, just a little bit. We have been brainwashed and been hit a little hard about how good people get the fucking, like, you know, like they, they get a kick, they get stunk for dumb. And I think that that allows for bad things to happen because good people in good places that can do well, they are skittish to do it because of the, 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 the backlash that they might get or the bullshit that they might get because people yeah. will not help them as they ought to be helped or whatnot. So do it any fucking way. Scale back. Start small. Do whatever the fuck. All three of us believe in community organization. All three of us. That is where all this shit starts from. And whether or not that is something that is quote unquote important or quote unquote, you know, meaningful, start with some dumb shit. If you like to crochet, get a crochet circle going. If you like to fucking eat popcorn, fucking get some corn going in the back of your house, whatever the fuck. You check what I mean, but start someplace. That is that is why, listen, no lie, I love Mel for that. I love you for that as well, D. But it needs to start someplace. It can't just be like, yo, we're going to wait on the next man to fucking do it. That's why that we're waiting right now for COVID to fucking drop her hair right now because we're waiting on somebody else to fucking do it for us. You know what I mean? We all got some part to play. We all got some part to play. Individual responsibility, I get you that. But the leaders have got to come forward to and stop being, like, stop being a pussy. I'm sorry. Even though we like, we, we like pussy. Can we use the word dick? Stop being a dick. Like- Fine then. Stop being a wimp. Okay, okay, okay. I can live with that. Since you're PC. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yo, um, I don't want to have the last monologue. So I don't know. Mel, you want to put something forward? Do you want to put something forward? The honor um, to the Sure, thanks. Uh, thank you guys, first of all, for mm-hmm. um, having me. Uh, I was very happy to get the invite. I know we had some scheduling snafus, but I'm happy to wrap it up for the for the season finale. Um, congrats again to you guys for even starting because a lot of people talk about, you know, doing a podcast, et cetera, but it's good that you've started. And I hope to see, um, you know, more content uh, when you guys get into a studio and stuff like that. It's coming, <laughs> don't worry. It's coming, yeah. It's um, coming, man, don't worry. Don't yeah, worry. no, so thank you again. And it was a great discussion. I always like to, to have these kind of talks, um, you know, clarify anything that people want to know. Um, I try to be as, as open as possible um, while respecting, you know, whatever confidentiality rules that, that, that are in play. Um, so it's good that also I get the opportunity to talk about politics and how it works with St. Martin's Parliament and where we're at right now. And I'm looking forward to seeing this, you know, on the, on the channel. Yeah, and bro. I wish you guys continued success. And maybe in the future, you know, I'll uh, be able to come back and um, we can, you know, Not maybe. talk more about how gaming makes me able to make my decisions. Listen. <laughs> Not even maybe, sweetheart. Trust you and me. You're on the goddamn list, season two. Don't even fuck with that. <laughs> Yo, D, you got anything to add to ask or whatnot? No, I just want to uh, thank Melissa. Thanks for making time. I know MPs are very, very busy people, but we mm-hmm. just, just started getting into it. So you're definitely coming back because this convo ain't, ain't done. And there are like 50 million other convos to be for had. Sure. So... So by now we are already booking you for uh, for the next season. For sure, for sure, for sure. Hey, I, I like to end. Uh, yeah, something that we started in the middle of the season, but I like to end with 
what y'all planning to do this weekend. Me and D are already kind of known, but still good to talk about it. But I'll ask the MP first. What's up for your weekend this weekend, sweetheart? This weekend, um, I don't think I actually have plans this weekend. Not yet. <laughs> Probably yet. Yeah, I like, I like, you know, it's good to have a relaxing weekend. Um, this is actually a non-meeting week of parliament. And then next week we're back at it. So the weekends before a meeting week are usually spent, you know, preparing, bracing myself, uh, you know, to do battle. So yeah. Hey, no bullshit. If Corona wasn't a conversation, it would have also been a moment to start to get prepared. Or if not, you're in the middle of kind of already, huh? Like, yeah. For real, for real. Like that's yeah. that that's how big a hole that this fucking thing left. Because, that, yeah. Yo, e- eating your carbs, doing fucking push-ups, getting ready for that, you know, for that fucking alcoholic soap that is <laughs> juve. You know what I mean? Yeah, stressing Hell. about my costume. Would it be ready in time? All that kind of shit. <laughs> yo, D wouldn't even be here, Dredge. She would be on fucking sabbat right now. Believe that. <laughs> Believe that. Believe that's that. Weird. All right. But yeah. D, what are you up to this weekend? What are you up to this weekend, sweetheart? Guess what, Marlo? Fuck my home. ass is going to be right here. I ain't going <laughs> nowhere. In my house, in my yard, that's where I've got to be. Right, girl. Mm. Poor Seoul. Yo, man, the same. The same, the same, the same. And um, especially to everyone that is out there in the Curacao, all over the world, if you're in lockdown, please respect the fucking... You might not agree with it, maybe, but respect... The restrictions that are in place because at the end of the day is all about trying to make sure that everybody get forward everybody gets to the point we need to get to we all don't like it we all don't love it but at the same fucking time it is what it is you know what i mean um wait, 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 shout, out, shout out to our sister islands aruba bonaire um bonaire send down a bunch of ventilators for us Yo, aruba for is accepting um covid patients that our hospital can no longer carry so people this shit is serious aruba's wow. um I'm receiving us in. with open arms and of course the netherlands helping with the vaccines helping with um with capacity like staff and all those kind of things so yeah. it, is, it is a horrible situation but as usual in all this horribleness we are we are coming together and that's that's a beautiful thing and this is what it is Ladies, I cannot tell you how proud I am and how happy I am for this particular episode because it caps off a fucking endeavor. To my co-host, I must say thank you for every fucking thing that you've had to put up with, both in front of and behind the camera with me, with everything else. To the MP, Jesus Christ, I couldn't have asked for a better fucking guest. Thank okay. you, sweetheart. Real talk, real fucking talk. My lady, I'm forever grateful and I am your banner man. My lady. Y'all... Unless anything else needs to be said, unless anything else needs to be done. We have been the Drunken Monks. My name is Marla Brown. That's Denise Fiber. We are the Drunken Monks. We yeah. are the Drunken Monks. Forgive me. Yeah. And we have had the Honorable MP, Melissa Gums, as our guest. Stay tuned because big fucking things are coming for season two. I got to say it. I have to promote. I have to plug. Big yeah. fucking things are coming for season two. And ladies and gentlemen, this was season one. Good night. Good night. Good night. Deuces. Deuces. All righty.